hello everyone and welcome to this month's EMBL ABR webinar, which will be about the UCSC Genome Browser. My name is Jeff Christensen from the EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource, or often called EMBL ABR for short, and I'll be your host for today. My colleague Susa Sabine from ARDC, which is formerly Anne's Nectar Arts, <laughs> and Christina Hall from EMBL ABR are behind the scenes co-hosting this webinar with me. Um, EMBL ABR is a distributed national research infrastructure network and we provide bioinformatics support to life science researchers across Australia. It was set up as a collaboration with the uh, European Bioinformatics Institute or EBI to maximise Australia bioinformatics capability. We currently have 13 nodes which are shown here on this map across Australia and all of us undertake or support bioinformatics research around a few key areas and these are data, tools, compute, training, standards and platforms. Uh, before we get started, I just mention a couple of housekeeping items. So all attendees will be in listen only uh, mode. So your microphones have been muted during the presentation and that's to minimize background noise. If you do have a question uh, in the GoToWebinar software, there's a question pod. So please type in any questions there. Um, and we'll be re relaying these to uh, Bob, the presenter today. Um, um, he'll be uh, answering those questions at the end of the webinar. Um, this broadcast will be recorded and we'll make it available on the EMBL ABR YouTube channel. Um, that'll be in about a week and we'll notify you by email when they're available. So today we're very excited to have Robert Kuhn, uh, who is the Associate Director of the UCSC Genome Browser, delivering um, this webinar. And uh, reading through his bio, you seem to be a true California dog. Um, so he received his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, that was in biochemistry and molecular biology, where he was studying the centromeres of yeast. Following a postdoc at UC Berkeley, UC uh, USDA Plant Gene Expression Center, he was teaching biochemistry, molecular biology and genetics at UC Santa Cruz. He joined the UCSC Genome Browser Project in 2003, where he is now Associate Director and he has a particular interest in clinical genetics. He spends considerable effort uh, training people in the use of the browser, helping bring the fruits of the human and other genome projects to scientists worldwide and learning from them how to improve it. So today in this webinar, we have 152 people registered um, and we will explore the UCSC browser through an overview of the browser, what it is and its history, as well as covering the following um, tasks users can perform, such as configuring the display, track settings, exporting browser images for publication, how to search data, as well as uploading and displaying your own data. Okay, so that's the introduction over. So I will now hand over to Bob and make him the presenter. Thank you, good morning. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, appreciate this opportunity to speak to all of you faceless people. It's, it's not my favorite method of getting uh, across the, uh, the wonders of the genome browser because I can't tell if you're bewildered, enthused, or even there. So we're just going to have to uh, make believe that you are listening. And uh, I want to show you the browser and show you today some of the cool things that it does and uh, kind of give you an overview of that. And tomorrow we'll get into some of the more, uh, uh, more complicated and also more interesting um, features of the browser. Okay, so this is the homepage of the genome browser. Uh, actually, I want to start with my slides. There we go. Let's do that. Okay, so I want to start with uh, some PowerPoint slides here, which are not loaded prop properly here. There we go, finally. Okay, sorry. The, uh, we have some disclosures. We get royalties from sale of browser licenses, and we have a contract with a, a company that we build some uh, software, uh, some data sets typically for them, and most of which wind up in the browser anyway. So uh, I want to start with acknowledgments because I'm going to be uh, moving away from slides into a live demo pretty quickly, and then I usually forget to go back to the acknowledgments. Um, so most of our funding comes from US uh, NIH, uh, National Human Genome Research uh, Institute, and we have some funding from some of these other, uh, other places as well. So our browser team, 
So when you're following along, do you see that when that box of mine? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the browser team consists of 20 plus or minus individuals and uh, who have a long standing association with the browser. I joined the browser team in 2003 and uh, David, Jim, Angie, Kate, Hiram, and Jorge were all here when I started. So, so we've got a pretty deep institutional knowledge and uh, a lot of cross training. A lot of people know how to do a lot of different things in the browser. Uh, our quality assurance team is really um, unusual for an academic software project because uh, typically projects are not supported long term. And so they decay away a little bit when the grad student or postdoc who did the work is there uh, has left. Um, but our QA team is there to put a second set of eyes on everything that gets released. And they're there to uh, uh, help make sure that uh, we find the bugs before you do. And so we operate like a small uh, uh, software company within uh, the confines of the university or within the, uh, under the umbrella of the university. Uh, Jim, he's still our team leader in PI and uh, he's primarily a, a programmer. A little slow. Okay, so for those of you who don't know California that well, we are on the central coast of uh, California, um, nowhere near USC, which is a uh, not one of the University of California campuses. Uh, they're down in LA. Uh, UCSF and UCSD are all camp are all campuses of UC uh, University of California, but they're frequently mistaken for each other and for us. So we're supposed to say UC Santa Cruz now. Um, and so here we are in close up. We're across the bay from Monterey and across the mountain from Silicon Valley in San Jose. And uh, here's our team. Here's Jim in the uh, in the Redwoods across the street from our building here. And uh, a few other people that I'll be talking about some of the work they've done. Uh, you'll probably hear some of the work that Max has done. And uh, Angie, would you go, Angie? There's and Angie's here on the uh, on the right. Uh, so I want to point out that we have a YouTube training channel, which has 12 to 15, something like that, um, videos that allow uh, you to learn certain things about the browser, certain kind of, I wouldn't say esoteric, but hard to find, useful, but hard to find things. And uh, they're all indexed, so you can click right into the middle of it, and there's a transcript so you can read it. If you don't want to waste 10 minutes listening to a video that's not what you're looking for, you can scan through the transcript first. Uh, you can get them to them directly via this link here or uh, via our, uh, our training page. And our training page is also where um, you, you find some other resources as well as where you would uh, uh, get a hold of us if you wanted an in-person training. Uh, we'll come and give a, a workshop uh, one or two days in length typically. Uh, and if you know anybody uh, who would maybe benefit from an in-person training such as this one, but with a little bit more face-to-face -face involved, um, then that's where you would send them to uh, contact us. So here are some links that'll be useful today. The top link is the Genome Browser itself. The bottom link is a page that has some content that I'll be referring to from time to time uh, through today's presentation. So I actually, I encourage you to, I'll leave it on the screen for a second. I encourage you to open up a second window or tab on your browser. I encourage you to uh, have both of these active and uh, so you can follow along in real time as I go. So here are some of the objectives for today. We're going to talk about uh, uh, the latest versions of the human genome and in, in general kind of the difference between one release of a genome uh, and the subsequent release of a genome. Uh, navigation features and uh, how to share your data in a session or share your, um, share your view of the browser. And uh, you can have your own data turned on in the browser and uh, have that as part of an active session. So you can share it with somebody and then that becomes the starting point for uh, zooming around in the browser. Uh, I'm gonna talk about four different relatively recent uh, uh, data sets, GTEx, CRISPR, Gene Interactions, and Nomad, and the conservation data track, which um, has been on the browser for a long time, um, but it's a very useful um, way to look at the uh, evolutionary relationships among uh, various species. Uh, custom tracks is a feature we have for loading our own, your own data into the browser, and then it becomes visible along with our data, and also with third-party data that I'll mention uh, in passing at least, uh, track hubs. If I don't, remind me near the end. Um, it's a way to get a hold of more content than we actually have in the, uh, the main page of the browser, and it's data that are um, 
hosted by third party uh, individuals, but can be integrated directly into the browser. And I'll also show you how to get DNA, uh, a particular region. You can download the actual DNA in a FASTA file, just a bunch of G's, A's, T's, and C's. And then we'll also use it as input uh, to do a little ISPCR. And I encourage questions throughout, um, but uh, Jeff encourages you to ask your questions and we will hold them till the end and ask, answer them all together in a block at the end. So the architecture of the browser can be cartoonified in this fashion. Um, the blue regions on the uh, browser window here are um, things that UCSC maintains and outside the blue areas are things that come from us or are offsite. Uh, so typically the data come in from the outside, uh, even things that we compute very heavily on, such as our comparative genomics data, are um, relying on data that came from somebody else's sequencing in the first place. We don't do any sequencing here via uh, genome assemblies. And so we in import those data and then uh, um, compute over them to generate our data uh, tracks on the genome browser. The, uh, an example of the kind of third-party data we may import would be all of the RNAs from GenBank are typically brought into uh, UCSC every, uh, every weekend. We download everything from GenBank that we don't already have and then align all of the RNAs to all of the organisms. We're now at 200 different genome assemblies from roughly 125 different animals. Uh, that's obvious from that, that some of the animals have multiple uh, genome assemblies, which typically are more mature versions of a previous assembly. And so an RNA from mouse, for example, will wind up aligning very well to the mouse genomes. And it also aligns pretty well to rat and other animals and human and sometimes as far away as Drosophila. And when it does, uh, we put the data uh, in a table and the table um, we have two different kinds of data storage. The RNA goes into a, a flat file, and it's just simply a, uh, a file full of G's, A's, T's, and C's, or U's if it's an RNA. And um, in the MySQL table are the alignment parameters, so we know where to draw boxes on the browser. So when you click on one, it's already pre-computed, and you don't have to wait for the alignment like you do if you submit a, uh, a query to uh, NCBI, for example. So the mouse data will go into a table on the mouse called mouse RNAs, and on all the other organisms in a table called other RNAs. So each RNA is represented a couple hundred times or as many as a couple of hundred times in the various uh, uh, databases. And it's a, they're available to you uh, simply with a click of the mouse. So both kinds of data are then available to the browser itself. It's, it's an acronym for Common Gateway Interface, which simply describes a program that we use to convert your click into a new picture on your screen. It does a database query, it does some comp computation on it, grabs out all the RNAs in the window you're looking at, for example, and throws them back on your screen. And so we call a data track any um, bit of information that comes out of a single table in the MySQL uh, database. And uh, there's a table for RNAs, there's a table for gene predictions, there's a table for DNA methylation sites and so forth. And so each one of those is represented in a single band along the browser view. We call that a, a data track. And I'll be using that word quite a lot uh, in the next hour and a half or so. Um, other features of the CGIs do other things. We do alignment with the uh, program BLAT and ISPCR, which I mentioned on an earlier uh, slide. The table browser gives you direct access to the table and then all of the data wind up back on your screen uh, via the uh, CGIs. When you click onto an item in a browser track, uh, you're typically taken to a details page that gives you information out of the table for that particular item. And then from there, there's usually a link offsite to an individual uh, page that's specific for the, uh, the item you clicked on. And it goes into the web works of the uh, contributing uh, data um, providers. And then you can see uh, all of the additional detail that they have that we don't uh, download. So instead of trying to suck up all the data in the world, we suck up pointers to a lot of it. And then the pointers help us take you to their site so you can see the actual data uh, when you need it. That way they can update the details without us having to care about that as long as once in a while we update our pointers and so that uh, we, we get any new pointers that they may have added to their data sets. Uh, I mentioned track hubs uh, earlier in that these are data sets being maintained uh, and presented via the web 
at other locations, uh, not at UCSC, but we integrate it into the browser so that we can display that along with our data on your screen all at once. So like a 50,000 um, foot view of the genome browser uh, is that essentially it's a display engine for genomic annotations. Anything that has genomic coordinates can be, uh, anything that can be mapped to the genome can be used to uh, put a little box on the browser and it'll be the uh, raw material for us clicking away uh, to the actual individual uh, uh, data on the uh, uh, at, back at the uh, origin website. Uh, it has a consistent interface across all of those genomes, so you don't have to kind of relearn how to navigate when you go from fly to mouse to worm to, um, uh, to human and so forth. And if once you know how to navigate on one uh, organism, you can navigate on all of them. Uh, the only difference being that you will not have uh, the same data sets on every uh, organism. Human and mouse are much better supported with funds from the federal uh, agencies uh, worldwide, actually, and so they're much richer in terms of what data are available. Um, I like to think of it as a real-time tool for getting answers to your questions as you're working uh, instead of having to wait for, I don't know, a book to come from interlibrary loan or uh, reading through tons of papers. If you idly uh, uh, are curious about whether a particular gene is expressed in some particular animal, there's a good chance that you can find that information on the browser in the course of just a few minutes or just a few clicks. And uh, it could change the course of your research if you get the answer to that question uh, instead of like we used to do in the old days, we'd scratch our heads and go back to work because we didn't have a year in the bench to figure it out or a day to spend in the library. Um, so in real time, you get your information. Um, as an example for why and how the browser is useful, the example of human variation is a good one uh, because it's the subject of a lot of uh, uh, research these days. And uh, the particular variation I'm showing here is James Watson and Craig Venter, who are two of the uh, individuals to put their genomes on the web uh, earlier than uh, almost anyone else. And you can see that uh, Watson and Venter have two and three million variants, respectively, relative to the reference assembly. So the reference is three billion DNA bases taken from one individual. It's actually not just one individual, but any one location, it's just one individual. And Watson and Venter differ uh, by two or three million. Uh, they have 1.2 million of those variants in common, and then uh, one or two million variants each that the other doesn't have, as you can see in that Venn diagram right there. So down below, you see a browser view of the myoglobin gene. And you can tell by the Venn diagram that it doesn't really matter which gene you pick, you're going to have a similar pattern where a third or a half of them are, are in common, where here's a pair where Watson and Venter have in common. Here's three in a row that Watson has and Venter does not. And over here, there's a few of them in here that uh, Venter has and Watson does not. And uh, this other track, Watson plus Venter, is uh, a product of a query you can do on the table browser uh, as part of the genome browser. It's not part of our regular data set, but it shows the kind of thing you can do with uh, by intersecting data sets with each other, and you can get a separate uh, data track on the browser, and you can see where Watson and Venter uh, have uh, locations in common. You can even use that as raw material for another table browser query, and you can throw in Marjolein Creek if you like, or Archbishop II, and you can intersect Watson plus Venter with them and build up a multiple uh, uh, intersection. Uh, you can also do the other two lobes of the Venn diagram you see here, Watson only, Venter only, or the union where it's Watson plus Venter in the other sense where it's anything that Watson or Venter have. Uh, you can put any of them into a custom track. A uh, laboratory, a real life uh, utilization of a feature such as this might be if you sequenced a tri uh, trio, uh, you're interested in the parents and the child and the relationship uh, of the DNA variants uh, among them where you could add the parents to each other uh, in a union sense, not in the sense that I have on this track here. And that gives you the total heritable variation present in the two parents. And then if you subtract that from the variation of the child, what's left over is a graphical representation of any de novo variants that occurred during the uh, uh, formation of the gametes that, show, uh, that arose uh, in that child. And uh, there are a number of other ways you can think of how to use uh, such a uh, such a feature. 
So here's what that one or that uh, two or three million variants uh, looks like uh, against the background of the three billion bases of the uh, of the genome uh, of the reference. And so you can see what uh, you get when you uh, do a sequencing experiment. You might sequence somebody to 20 or 30x, and eventually you collapse it down to one fold coverage, your best guess at each location, what the uh, um, the pile up of the 20 very um, 20 uh, uh, reads at any given location. So right away, you've thrown away 95% of your data by uh, resolving it down to a, a, essentially a 1x consensus sequence. And then the next thing you do is you throw away 99.9% .9 of that to get down to the variance. Because we already know the genome, and so places where your sample matches the genome aren't particularly interested. interesting. You like to compare them, uh, your sample, to the reference to find out how your reference differs. So you're down to that little dark red spot on here, this 1% of the genome. I'm sorry, one-tenth of the 1% of the genome. But you're still stuck with two or three million variants to, uh, uh, to analyze. Uh, the genome browser has data sets from all over the world of both benign and known pathogenic variants that will help you uh, interpret the, the variation that you have in your individual sample. And um, in particular, here's a, a look at the evolution of the dbSNP data set uh, out of NCBI has continually um, increased the number of variants that are uh, have been determined, have been found in uh, populations on, all over the world. And you can see from the graph here that the uh, the amount of um, uh, variation has been increasing uh, quite. Uh, uh, seriously, three years, uh, but the data actually um, maybe six or eight years old along the scale. Uh, DB SNP uh, runs three or four uh, releases a year. You can see here that the common SNPs, these are defined as 1% uh, uh, frequency in the population, um, have not actually increased very much because by the time DB SNP version 132 was out, it looks like the common ones were already found, which makes some sense because already by then, uh, a lot of genomes had been found, and anything at the frequency of 100% is going to start showing up once you've sequenced the first two or 300. You're not going to be finding too many more that are 1% uh, frequency. The uncommon ones, however, have continued to increase, and dbSNP 151 is not on the genome browser yet. It was just recently re, uh, released, and it will be on the, uh, the public site uh, in not too much time. So uh, another type of variation that uh, people are interested in is variation with phenotype. And here's a representation of uh, maybe three or four years ago now, the data uh, indicating that uh, uh, LOVD, ClinVar, OMIM, HDMD, and Uniprot are all projects that uh, collect data with phenotypic uh, association. And they're, of course, of interest if you happen to have one of those variants in a sample you're analyzing, you can learn from what they already have in the database. And they're all available on the genome browser. So one of the values of having the genome browser um, aggregate data from all over the world is that you don't have to jump from database to database to see them. Yet, when you want to read the details, you can get from the browser to those databases and uh, easily see what the details are. Uh, so for example, here's um, one of the uh, variations, or one of the uh, data sets, uh, the LOVD. Uh, which is uh, headquartered in Leiden. It's the Leiden Online Variation Database. Uh, they, uh, there are actually a couple of uh, instances of LOVD in Australia uh, that are typically um, individual locus-specific databases where one individual investigator will collect all the variants that he or she uh, can uh, with respect to a single gene or group of genes that uh, that person is interested in. And you can see from the Venn diagram here that uh, none of these uh, databases has all of the variants that is known uh, throughout the world. And each of them has some that none of the other, uh, the three that I'm showing here do have. And there are a small number of them in the middle uh, there that overlap all three of them. If you uh, incorporate the other two databases that I showed earlier, you really only have 2,200 variants that are present in uh, every database. Uh, so your chances of having a variant that's already known and picking a database uh, among these five at random, it's a fairly small chance that you'll get uh, a variant. You certainly don't get the whole picture uh, unless you look at all of them. 
And so that's one of the values of the genome browser is that we import the data from all of those locations, and then you can uh, see where your variants are, uh, where, uh, where they're collected, and you get the details from those individual uh, sources. And you can see here, uh, this RDX gene here, you can see there are several variants here that are present in only one of the databases displayed. Some of them are in more than one, um, and none of them is in all. Uh, I have six on here because the flag SNPs uh, it's, it's a little bit of a weird database, so maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later. Some of them are phenotypically significant and some of them are not. So it's not kind of fair to put, put it in the Venn diagram on the uh, previous page. So you can jump to an active session um, for this particular region by using this URL down here. Um, and it will be a little different because these databases have been updated since this static slide was made. And uh, if you uh, use that URL there, it opens up a session that has all of those databases turned on at this location, but you can zoom around then from uh, that location to any other gene as you like and see the, uh, um, the contents of those uh, uh, other databases uh, on those other genes as well. So we have a, uh, a number of different ways of navigating uh, in the uh, genome browser, and our most recent addition is support for HGVS. It's an acronym I don't always remember. It's Human Genome Variation Society, I think. And it's typically a, uh, a RefSeq identifier, which identifies a specific isoform of a sp specific gene. And then that identifier followed by a C for cDNA, which tells us that this is going to be the nucleotide starting at the ATG as, the, as one, two, three. And then it's a G to T nucleotide change. Um, you can also use a protein identifier and a p-dot nomenclature then, uh, either in the three-letter or the one-letter um, uh, nomenclature, will take you directly to that particular amino acid uh, on this particular isoform. Sometimes uh, a, a gene has multiple, often a gene has multiple isoforms, and a particular amino acid 92 may be a different amino acid in the different uh, isoforms. Uh, but if you use the NP underscore nomenclature, then you're taken directly to a specific one and there's no ambiguity. Uh, we also have kind of, it's not official HGVS, but it's useful uh, in real time for people who know the gene and know the amino acid they want. They can use this nomenclature here um, with the caveat that the uh, isoform that we choose may not be the one that was chosen by the person for, uh, I mean, in the paper you're reading. So if someone says alanine 744 and you go to the browser, uh, it may not be an alanine there because it's going to be, in a, it might be in a different isoform. Uh, you can see using this link down here, uh, a complete list of the different kinds of um, HTVS that we support uh, on the genome browser. So typically a sequencing experiment uh, has a number of different steps and there are various steps along the way where UCSC becomes useful in inter interpreting your um, uh, your results. So I, I got this slide originally, I modified it from, I got this from Tim Hubbard, who's now at King's College in London. Uh, so in a typical sequencing exper experiment, you start with a, a DNA sample uh, or an RNA sample uh, actually also, and then some magic happens and you wind up with a BAM file. You get a sequence and in that, uh, that magic, that black box, uh, prior to being useful in the browser is all of your library prep if you're doing that or, or um, and all of your sequencing and uh, a few steps of your bioinformatic pipeline and you wind up with a BAM file which is a binary alignment mapper file which essentially shows where all the reads are uh, that came out of your machine how they align back to the original genome at that point genome browser can be useful to you for interpreting the uh, uh, the results, and you can see here this particular BAM track that I'm showing you is a, 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 a cartoon of the kind of signal you would get from a, uh, an antibody experiment where you pull down a piece of DNA and the center of this peak represents the place where the, uh, the target of that antibody uh, was bound to the original DNA, and then you have a bunch of overlapping reads that uh, spill out on either side. Uh, those data then can be condensed a little further. Uh, if you just want a coverage track, you don't need to uh, know about the individual reads. The coverage track can be converted to a uh, bed graph 
uh, file using a number of different tools. We have them in the Kent source tree, which underlies the, uh, the genome browser and all of the uh, processing we do uh, to get the data to you in the uh, usable form and graphics. Uh, a bed graph file can also be converted to a wiggle file or a big wig file, which is just a compressed version of the bed graph file that shows you the uh, coverage of the, uh, of the track. Uh, you can convert it directly using BAM to bigwig. And uh, in either way, you just wind up with a smaller file that shows you the coverage. Now, as part of the process, the next step would be to pull your variants out of there. Um, the BAM sequence has a lot of stuff that matches the reference. And uh, oftentimes, you're not interested in that, uh, where it matches the reference. But you are interested to see, well, if you're doing an RNA-seq experiment, you are. You're interested to see. Uh, how each exon is being expressed, and that's the endpoint of your experiment is the coverage at that place, and it varies from gene to gene and tissue to tissue, and it's your way of comparing a, uh, uh, you know, a sample, a normal versus a tumor, for example, or a treated versus control, that sort of thing. Your endpoint will be a, a peak uh, on the genome. In other experiments, you want to know how your sample differs from the reference. In that case, you call your variants and throw away the places where you have uh, you have matched the reference, and then you condense that into a VCF file variant call format, and it's a way of getting all of the variants together in uh, in one spot. The graphic I show here are data from the thousand genomes uh, uh, variation, and these data then are available in the browser. And a VCF file will actually hold uh, data from uh, one individual or hundreds of uh, hundreds of individuals or more. Uh, on the uh, uh, in the file, and then the browser can display them for you. Uh, ultimately, you may be interested in uh, learning what the variations uh, mean at the biochemical level, and we have a tool called the Variant Annotation Integrator. There are others out there uh, that uh, predict what the biochemical consequences will be. Do you have a missense? Do you have a, uh, a splice variant or a frame shift, uh, and so forth? And uh, that uh, information can be uh, downloaded in bulk or seen for small regions uh, on the, uh, the browser uh, directly. Uh, the last two steps, the clinical interpretation and clinical action, uh, that's up to you. We're data providers, we're data um, uh, displayers, uh, but we, uh, we don't do the, uh, the final step in the process. So getting back to that first step, this raw reads through uh, BAM and uh, SAM and BAM files, those um, steps uh, take place in a bioinformatic pipeline. And then to get the BAM file onto the browser, there's one additional step is you need to do an index. The files are typically too large to display on the browser via direct upload. So it's necessary to, uh, to do an index. And uh, the index can be done uh, using the uh, SAM tools um, uh, tool set, uh, which is not a UCSC product. Um, and then the index allows us to read your browser. So when you click into a region on the browser, you zoom in or zoom out, your query goes to us and says, give me the data for this region I'm looking at. The browser looks that up in the index, and then it goes to the main BAM file and pulls the data uh, that are needed to make the display and no more. So the file may be five gigs of data, and the amount of display may be just a few little packets, maybe just a few kilobases, I'm sorry, kilobytes of data that come out of the file. And uh, we display those kilobytes on the browser uh, fairly quickly, and you're not burdened with waiting for a, uh, an upload step that will actually time out if the file's too big. After about 30 minutes, the browser thinks you've gone away and it times you out. So then the result of that is you have a uh, display on your browser and the BAM file shows you with all of the uh, uh, all of the individual reads, and you can see the little red tick marks here. Was, it's a little bit bigger than it was on the previous uh, cartoon, but the little red tick marks show you where you have um, uh, uh, differences relative to the reference. So the way to load it into the browser is to put it on the web somewhere, and you do that and then tell the browser big data URL where the data live by giving it the path to your BAM file. The BAI file has to be in the same directory right next to the BAM file and have the same name. If you're not comfortable loading your data onto a website where people can find it uh, for a number of reasons, it may be patient data or it may be proprietary or you don't want your um, competitors to figure out what you're up to right now, you can download the software to your uh, machine 
and do this locally inside your firewall where it's safe and no one can uh, can figure out where it might be on your servers or try to hack Santa Cruz somehow and find it in our in our uh, directories. Um, in, in that case, it reverses the paradigm a little bit. You have the software next to the file and uh, you have to bring in data from us rather than load your data uh, uh, to us. So one of the things then you can do is it shows the mismatches in red and you can drag across the top of the, uh, the screen and zoom into a particular region and you might get to a spot that looks like this when you're zoomed way in, at which point you can actually see the data um, at the nucleotide level. You can see that, for example, here's a homozygous mismatch. The reference is a C, but we have a T in our sample here. And the sample's been, I'm um, sorry, this uh, variant has been seen before and it's already in uh, dbSNP. So you can click into that and learn uh, what's already known about it. Um, you can also see uh, heterozygotes, uh, or putative heterozygotes, if your coverage isn't very good, um, you may be a little suspicious of uh, believing that three A's in a, in a uh, reference, the reference here is a G, uh, it may be homozygous, it may be heterozygous, you, you know, depending on how much you care, you may need to do a little bit more sequencing to find out uh, uh, what it really is right there. Uh, quality scores come for free from the BAM file. If they're in the BAM file, then they show up as light color on the browser itself. And the browser is, um, extensible from uh, one base all the way up to a full chromosome. And I'll be mentioning tomorrow, there's actually a way to see pieces of genome that are not contiguous on the uh, on a chromosome. And that's a feature that was released uh, a couple of years ago uh, that now lets you load up a, uh, a file full of, or a list full of uh, regions and see all the regions on the browser all at once, even if they're not uh, next to each other in the genome. And speaking of new uh, display modes, um, we have a new feature that allows you to uh, load a file of your own that has that shows DNA uh, interactions of one location to another. Uh, that could be an enhancer that you believe uh, uh, regulates uh, the uh, transcription from a nearby gene. So you could put an arc there to uh, represent that, or it could be the uh, uh, the high C, three C, and five C type data where um, physical interactions between places uh, in the genome that are in the nucleus next to each other, even though they're not next to each other in the genome, you can say, okay, these two regions are physically close to each other when the uh, chromatin is folded into the nucleus. And so we're working on getting some data sets of that type into the browser. Uh, but the data uh, type is already available if you're interested in loading data like that yourself. Uh, we also have a new uh, feature called bar chart, uh, which uh, came out of the engineering done for the GTEx uh, um, project. And the bar chart lets you uh, show the expression level of a particular gene. The CLNN gene here, for example, might be expressed at different levels in different tissues. And so you can show all those data together at one location on the browser. A uh, reminder again that you can see some of our videos and uh, access to our training materials on that page. And uh, at this, this point, uh, I want to switch to doing a browser demo using uh, the Live Genome Browser. So I gave you the link, it's genome.ucsc.edu. And this is the home page. Uh, there's not much of interest on this page actually to a, a regular user other than the new features spot down here where the last three new things that we released. You can browse the whole 18 year history of the browser um, under more news there and uh, see what things you might've missed by not being uh, subscribed to this, uh, um, the mailing list. If you subscribe to it, you get an email or two a month, July, August, nothing in September. So it hasn't been that busy in the last few months. And that's where we, re where we release um, important new features. We release data all the time without announcing it, uh, unless it's something that's really big. For example, we re uh, announced Nomad when we, <coughs> when we released that. Uh, because it was a huge data set and it's uh, in widely uh, in wide use throughout the, uh, the community. Uh, the four new genome assemblies might not be interesting to you. Uh, I don't remember what they are, but we can click into that and I'm not going to do that right now. If you want to know, you can find out for yourself. Um, so before we go any further, I want to reset the browser using up here the reset all user settings because that will reset your cookie to the defaults and if you're following along, and I encourage you to do from here out, uh, you'll be able to uh, 
have the same image on your screen that I have on mine right now. Otherwise, the uh, the browser will remember your cookie and go to that place instead of uh, uh, where I intend to lead you. Um, each one of our genomes have a, has a view sequences button here. If you go in there, you can see kind of the state of the, uh, the genome assembly. Some of the uh, genomes we release are not in such great shape. There may be 20,000 pieces, uh, none of them the size of a full chromosome. And you would find that out by uh, clicking into here. Uh, the human genome is pretty mature. And you can see here that we have each of the chromosomes uh, fully assembled. And then down here, you have chromosome X, Y, and the mitochondrion, followed by a bunch of other um, pieces of DNA that are part of the official release, but they're called the alts. So here's a chunk of chromosome one alts. And these are alternate versions of certain locations of the genome uh, that uh, the consortium has seen fit to include in the, uh, in the reference assembly because they're relatively common in the world population. Uh, and they happen not to match the re reference very well uh, because of some rearrangement uh, that uh, has taken place somewhere back in the evolutionary tree and uh, origin of the human species, but large chunks of the population may have a different arrangement of genome than uh, uh, does the particular individual represented by the spot you're at on the genome. So the uh, original reference was something from people uh, kind of randomized, de-identified, and sequenced, and then each consortium did a particular chunk of the chromosome of one of those people they didn't know who. So at any one location, you have a haploid genome of somebody, but across the whole genome, you have a, an aggregate haploid genome of a bunch of individuals. Uh, some places in the genome are fairly variable. Uh, anything involved in the immune system, the HLA and the MHC regions, for example, are quite variable, and they are among the sequences that are contained in these, uh, these alt sequences. So I want to go now from here uh, just directly to the genome browser. Actually, let's not. Let's go back to, let's go to the genomes link here, back to the page where we were, because I want to um, switch here from HG38 to HG19, which is the uh, most recent, well, the second most recent uh, version of the genome browser, I'm sorry, of the genome assembly, but it's still used twice as often as the HG38 reference, which is newer. Um, in part because HG19 is better annotated and uh, people like the data sets they're, uh, they're used to and they want to see them and not all of them have been lifted to 38. You can see on the left side of the screen here all of the organisms that we, uh, that we host in uh, evolutionary order based on their uh, distance from human. And at the upper left you can see some common uh, animals, model organisms that are uh, uh, among the best annotated organisms in the uh, uh, in the uh, molecular biology community. So now finally I'll hit go and we'll go in to see the browser graphic. And because we all hit uh, uh, view in other, uh, I'm sorry, we uh, re reset browser settings up there, we should all have the same page here. So this page has uh, uh, default data sets turned on just to show you some of the different types of data that we have. And in general, anything that's lined up on the browser here uh, lines up relative to these uh, coordinates up here. And uh, anything in the browser then uh, is based on the coordinates. The only exception is this multi uh, bar chart graph here. And it sort of represents the reference because along the bottom here is a, a, a thin bar that shows you that we're talking about the um, expression of genes across this entire gene, I'm sorry, the, expre the expression from this gene across the entire footprint of the gene. And these individual bars here don't align with the coordinates. They essentially are different tissues that uh, have been tested in this uh, GTEx sample. So the GTEx project did 53 tissues from 8,000 samples from close to 600 donors. And then those data were aggregated and averaged across the whole genome. And the data are expressed in terms of RPKM. So it's reads per kilobase of uh, transcript uh, per million reads in the original experiment. So if we zoom in or out, uh, this graphic won't change size, whereas everything else will. For example, if I put my mouse up here at the top bar, and the uh, we call this the position bar, and I just drag it right or left to include uh, in this case, I dragged to the right to include this exon, and I let it go. 
It's going to uh, make everything on this screen wider. It's going to make this peak wider. It's going to make uh, this comparative genomics set wider here. But that graphic will still um, will still show you the expression from all 53 tissues. At this resolution, you can see that we can just barely squeeze in the uh, amino acid names because we now have just enough uh, pixels per uh, amino acid here per codon to show that. If I zoom out by a factor of three, it'll likely be too small then to show the actual amino acids, but we still try to give you a sense of scale by giving you alternating colors to indicate uh, neighboring codons. Uh, because a black box on the browser means that you have to go up to the top of the screen here and poke around and try to divide by three here and so forth. So it's a 100 here and 200 there. So maybe we got 30 uh, amino acids, but it's not always obvious what the scale is. If I zoom in even uh, closer to just pick just three or four amino acids, then we're actually able to show you the uh, number of the individual amino acids. And so here you see we have um, leucine 39 and threonine 40. Uh, you can use the little double-headed arrows at the end here to jump to, as it says with the mouse over, to the start of exon two out of the five, and it'll jump out, uh, jump over there. At the bottom of the screen, you see uh, the comparative genomics track at this uh, much zoomed in level where individual codons are shown. And you can see um, through evolutionary time from human all the way back to lamprey, what amino acids are uh, shown there and the conservation level. Hmm. If I zoom out by a factor of 10, then we'll see uh, 110 uh, uh, base pairs on the screen there. And you can see here that we've got uh, nucleotides where there's no amino acid translation and translation where it's available. So here's a conserved uh, valine uh, a codon. And you can see that even though it's conserved at the amino acid level, it's not particularly conserved in the third base of the codon due to the, uh, the wobble base. Uh, nine of the 16 blocks in the familiar four by four uh, matrix, nine of those 16 blocks uh, allow for the third nucleotide to be N, so that uh, for uh, valine here, we have G, T, anything. And in all of these amino acids, then uh, many of them are not the same as humans, so the conservation score falls off at the third. If I zoom out by a factor of 10 again, uh, we should get pretty much the whole um, uh, exon here in the middle of the screen. And you can see that the conservation score uh, pretty much hangs over the uh, amino acids and it starts to decay away in this uh, conservation track as we get further and further away from human. I'm going to clean the screen up a little bit by uh, my favorite button on here is hide all to make it uh, essentially just the position bar at the top. Then I'm going to turn UCSC genes track on to pack and I'm going to go down the screen into the conservation uh, section here. Uh, the blue bar we call the conservation group. So anyway, let's turn the think here, not the uh, pull down menu. And um, the conservation track here um, gives us the opportunity to turn on all 100 species that are available in this track. On the right side of the screen here, you can see the whole 100 species in uh, evolutionary order. Down near the bottom, we have uh, fish and birds. And we'll turn the track on to full and leave these other data subtracts turned off right now. That's a long story for another day and I'm not going to get into it right now. Uh, we had by default about eight or nine uh, individual species turned on. And now that we turn all of them on and hit submit, we'll see the entire 100 uh, species here. And you can see how the signal decays away as you get away from the, uh, uh, from the uh, exon in the screen here. The further away you get from human, the more likely it is that the introns have had time to evolve away from a human since the last common ancestor. And uh, your display looks uh, much more exon specific. So now when you scroll up and down a page, sometimes you lose track of your register. You lose track of where you are up there. I'm going to zoom out another... Uh, factor of 10, and we'll pretty much pick up this whole gene then, and we'll see that we've got uh, a handful of exons with a good conservation score, and 
I'm going to put my mouse over this one Exxon over here where I did before. And then when I re release it, I have the opportunity here to highlight uh, using any color I want. I can put a single highlight on there. But uh, instead of accepting the default color, I'm going to use something really bright so that it'll shine through the gaps in the comp uh, conservation track. And then I'm going to add a single highlight here and show you that now that you've identified the spot on the uh, genome, you're interested in this one here, which is three out of five of the uh, exons of this particular gene. You scroll down the page here and you can see how tightly uh, controlled the um, conservation score is that it's really exon specific. So as educators, I think we're, uh, it's incumbent upon us to make the case that the footprint of evolution is so obvious, it's so present in the DNA of the animals that are alive today, that the whole paradigm of biology that rests on it uh, is supported by the DNA of uh, animals that are uh, alive today. And there's no um, need to rely on esoteric things like continental drift and radioactive decay and all that other stuff. So the theory of evolution is supported um, by uh, the genomes that are uh, alive today. And it is an active theory. It's still under test. That's what a theory is. And just like the theory of gravity, it explains just about everything we know about biology. And as time goes on, we modify it a little bit. But just because it's called a theory doesn't mean it's not, uh, not believable. Uh, as long as I'm here, and we've drawn this image here with the red uh, bar under it, I want to uh, just highlight at random kind of the middle of this uh, um, intron right here. And rather than use red, I'll use a, a more subtle color, maybe this orange here. And this button here lets us add a second highlight. This first button here would replace the existing highlight uh, with this new one. But by adding a highlight here, we've uh, colored this particular region. And uh, I have yet to reach the uh, maximum number of highlights you can add. It's probably 32 or 256 or something like that. Um, we all, uh, have the availability of a feature up here uh, to export the file or ex export the image into a PDF. And so uh, if you use that, you have the option to export the actual graphic itself or that smaller graphic <laughs> above it that just shows the chromosome, uh, the banding pattern, uh, the gem sustaining pattern. And uh, the uh, value of this is getting a PDF instead of a screenshot is that you've now got a vector graphics uh, display and you can uh, zoom in and zoom out without making it fuzzy. If you just take your screen and then you want to put it in your nature paper, the publisher is going to say that's too fuzzy, make it smaller. And then when you do that, it's too small to, to be legible. But because it's PDF and it's vector graphics, you can uh, hit the plus sign here on the zoom. And there's a lot of data on this screen, so it takes a, uh, a little time to uh, there we go. It takes a little time to expand, but you can make your entire poster uh, on the uh, uh, still uh, legible, put it into Photoshop, save it as 300 dots per inch, and you got a nice clean graphic no matter what the publisher asks for. So in general, when we open up a, a window to PDF, it's in a separate window, so I'll just crash that window, go back here to the genome browser using forward navigation, and we're back at the spot we were at uh, earlier. Speaking of navigation, there's a lot of ways to get around in the browser. I'm going to use the right mouse button here to crash this uh, uh, conservation track because it takes a while to, to load. Uh, I can use the right mouse button here to uh, get rid of one of my two highlights. And I can click into this particular uh, <clears throat> detail for this uh, genes track here and read about the SOD1 gene. There's a ton of data on this particular page of information about it. And I'm just going to go over uh, a couple of salient features. There's the short version of it. Typically, you'll learn what the SOD stands for, superoxide dismutase. And then the longer version from RefSeq gives you information about uh, mutations in this gene. So there's biological information. There's superoxide. There's biochemical information. Superoxide radicals get broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, a little bit about the gene structure or the protein structure, copper and zinc ions. It may be a homodimer, maybe a heterodimer or tetramer or something like that. You get that kind of information here. Uh, you can click into the pathways link, scroll down the page, and see individual pathways. Uh, Huntington's disease. Uh, this is one of the genes in the Huntington's pathway. 
clicking there takes you to the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. And highlighted in red here is uh, the gene that we uh, clicked on. Or is it? Oh, there it is, SOD1 gene. So I'll crash that window and point out that we have up to four different types of pathways data available uh, in this section here. And sometimes they slice it different ways, sometimes via the disease, sometimes via the actual uh, pathway for oxygen, such as here, the peroxisome is where the, uh, the action is for SOD1. Uh, using the uh, back button, we go back to the top of the page, and we have a whole page full of links to other resources. For example, if you click into OMIM, the much used uh, online Mendelian inheritance in man page uh, shows up. And uh, they've been curating the literature for 50 years. At the bottom of the page, they have this massive reference section here. And a little further up from there, they have individual variants where here's an individual uh, amino acid, glycine 93, that has been converted to an arginine with a link to the paper uh, so you can see exactly how that particular uh, it's a single nucleotide variant uh, affects the gene. Uh, once again, you can crash this window and you're back to the browser and uh, if I hit the back button now, we're back to the genome browser itself. The position box is very extensible. You can type in an RSID number and navigate to that reference SNP. You can type in the name of a gene. Um, you can type in coordinates, for example. You can type it in the same format here with the colon and a hyphen, or you can leave out the colon and hyphen if you want to copy paste it out of some other application. Chromosome 1, 23 million to 24 million and go there and you're immediately at that 1 million basis with the data set that you have turned on, still turned on. You can see here genes, uh, some genes in this region have um, multiple isoforms in them. Uh, you can zoom very easily into a sp small chunk of the genome uh, and browse around uh, uh, in these uh, genes of interest. If I go back one more, uh, I can show you uh, back at that page that you have multiple isoforms. You have the option of turning off those isoforms using our reference uh, or our little uh, button on the left side here to our configuration page. That little button on the left side of every track uh, takes you to a configuration page where oftentimes you have many options to turn on secondary data sets to change the configuration. Uh, right now, I'm simply going to uncheck the splice variance button uh, or checkbox and hit submit and we'll go back to the genome. And now each one of these genes uh, is being shown with the canonical transcript, which is our representation of the, uh, uh, typically it's the um, best annotated uh, one from RefSeq. Uh, it's the one that they call uh, uh, validated. So it's the one that has the best uh, amino acid sequence and uh, the best uh, transcript. Other data tracks that we have, and you, as you can see when we scroll down here before, uh, there are many. Uh, up here in the mapping and sequencing group is one that uh, uh, are the only two tracks that we have that are not actually underlain by an individual table in the MySQL database. Uh, those two tracks are uh, restriction enzymes and uh, short match. So each one of our data uh, blue bar groups typically has a track or two at the beginning that we think are important followed by the rest of the tracks in alphabetical order. So short matches down here among the S's. And I will actually, instead of turning it on, I will go here to the link uh, and turn uh, and open the uh, configuration page because here's a place where you can type in some DNA sequence. And you can see from some of the examples here that the IUPAC degeneracy code is supported uh, so that R is purine uh, and so forth. So I'm gonna type in GGATTC and uh, leave it on pack and submit. So this kind of spans the gap between reading the sequence yourself and having a sequence that you can import into our BLAT tool because BLAT doesn't start to work until you type in uh, maybe 21, 22 uh, 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 nucleotides. But so here, each one of these individuals is a GGAT, GGATCC region. And if I uh, scroll over there, you can see... Uh, uh, more closely uh, where all of these uh, individual six base uh, spots are. I'm going to scroll in uh, or rather zoom in one more time and 
at a certain resolution, you start to see, we don't see it yet, but we see the nucleotides. Before I do that though, I wanna turn on in the mapping and sequencing uh, region here and turn on the restriction enzymes. And I will simply turn all the restriction enzymes on to pack. Um, you can choose individual restriction enzymes. Um, if you just put in the ones in your freezer, for example, you can just type in those with uh, commas on the configuration page. And you can see here that we have uh, this particular one is GGATTC. You may have recognized that that's a palindrome and it is likely to be a restriction enzyme. So that if we zoom into that, um, you'll see at, uh, at close range that here is, uh, where did it go? Is it underneath this thing here? Yeah. Okay, so here's your GGATCC. And you can see here that if you scroll up the page, GTA, TCC, did I type it wrong? Maybe I did. That was supposed to be a BAM site. Maybe I'm just not seeing it. Let's click back into here and see what it is we have. GG, oh yeah, see, I typed it wrong. If it had been the GGATCC, it would have been a BAM site. But I'll leave that to you to figure out for yourself rather than... Uh, I go back and redo it. Uh, you can see here that we've got uh, tick marks where the cuts are, the black spots, uh, the black streaks are where the uh, recognition sequence uh, sequence is. Let's uh, turn off this track using the uh, right mouse button, switch it to hide. And I want to uh, briefly show you a couple of other interesting tracks that uh, have uh, been released to the browser not too long ago. So up here in the... Um, genes and gene predictions uh, track, we have the CRISPR track, and I will turn that on to show, and turning on the CRISPR track, then we'll have to zoom out to pick up some, uh, I'll zoom out by 100x here, so 8,600 bases to the window, and you can see here that the CRISPR track covers the uh, individual exons and uh, read the color information. All of our tracks, if they have color in them somewhere down the page, you can interpret them. And you can see here that high, high predicted coverage uh, cleavage is uh, shown in green. And you not only see uh, the individual sequence of this guide, but you see other places in the genome where there are up to four different mismatches uh, to the reference uh, guide that is represented by this individual spot uh, on the genome. So the, um, that explains why it is so uh, computationally expensive. There are a lot of ways to get four mismatches to a, a 23 uh, nucleotide piece of DNA, but this helps tremendously in figuring out your own um, um, interpretation of where you want your guides to be uh, in the genome because they're all pre-computed. Um, one thing I promised to show you today was uh, my sessions. This is as good a time as any to actually uh, log in and show you a session. Um, you have a login that you can log in yourself, uh, but I'm not going to give it to you today because I want to show you that I can create a session uh, simply by logging in under um, my name, which for the purposes of today is username example and password genome. Uh, I've learned from experience that if I gave you the, uh, whoops, there it is. If I gave you the login, then um, one of you is likely to overwrite my session and then it won't be the same as it is for everybody else. So I'm going to save the setting, say settings here. I'm going to call it HD19 underscore uh, CRISPR, since I apparently have not saved it that way before. But before I go away from here, I'm going to instruct you to load it yourself by using username example and session name HG19 underscore CRISPR. So if you do that, oh, it will overlay. Okay, never mind. Let's go CRISPR AUS for Australia. Okay, so now I've saved my session. And if you type in that string of characters using username example and then session name HG19 underscore CRISPR AUS. I always keep the prompt for the genome assembly so that I don't accidentally, for example, save chromosome X and it turns out I'm on horse, which is what Equicab 2 is. Uh, 
in one of my sessions. So to avoid getting confused about which genome I'm in, I always keep the prompt or just the conversion from HD 18 to 19 to 38. So if I hit browser now, and if you do that on your own uh, screens as well, you should come to a page that has exactly this um, uh, representation. If you are looking at a narrower or wider screen, you know, some of the session might be off the page here on the right side. You can hit the resize button here and then the, uh, the image will resize to match the screen you're looking at. So if you're loading somebody else's session and you're using a different screen size than they had when they did it, uh, you'll be able to make it fit the screen that you're looking at. Everything uh, expands or contracts accordingly. So I will turn off the CRISPR track here using my right mouse button. Uh, the CRISPR regions is simply a, a small uh, cartoon that shows you which regions have been uh, have coverage. So that if you're at a spot where there are no good guides, uh, you could tell that there um, it just it wasn't computed if it's not also in the regions uh, section. So if I scroll down the page again, I want to pick up the uh, gene interactions uh, section. And that, that particular uh, data set is relatively recently uh, released <clears throat> in the phenotype and literature group. And I'll simply turn it on to pack. And the gene interactions track will be a single bar here for each gene. And it shows you that this particular gene, EPHB2, and I have no idea what that is. I chose it at random from the uh, zooming in and out, but that it has interactions with all of these other genes. EGF, TNF, these genes are familiar to me, uh, MAP, K1, EGFR, uh, and so forth. So if I click into there, I'm taken into an interface that was uh, built by uh, Max Hoistler, um, showed you his picture on an er earlier slide. And this shows you the interactions between this particular gene product and other genes. Um, as determined by uh, text mining or interactions that come from uh, uh, curated databases. So this is essentially a literature search or a search through databases that gives you information about these two genes um, that interact with each other. Uh, these data here are from uh, HPRD database. And uh, in text mining, there's 145 extracts. For example, uh, ERK activation is inhibited, uh, as you can read on the screen there. Um, and Max took data from curated databases and also data that he got by uh, mining text, where it might say something like EPHB2 uh, inhibits MAP2K1 and pulls strings like that out of the literature. And then he gives you the output. If I uh, click on this relationship here between the two, it gives you the actual data and links back to the paper. So as you must know, text mining uh, processes like these are kind of fuzzy and a little dirty. So some of the links you get might not be um, uh, legitimate, but you get uh, uh, clicks at least through to the paper or at least through to the abstract and maybe to the paper if your library uh, actually supports uh, download of the entire paper. If it's in PubMed Central, it's free and you can download it. And you can see here that it says is activation is strongly enhanced by overexpression of uh, this other gene, MKK6 and so forth. So that uh, you get a little snippet of the uh, the actual uh, output that generated the, uh, the bar we looked on the other uh, gene, on the other page. So if I go back to this uh, page here, this is actually fully interactive. You could click on for example, um, TNF, and you'll see the, uh, the relationship from the perspective of TNF, which may or may not actually have a drawn link to the one that we started from because it's showing the 25 best interactions. And down here is a grid that shows all of the interactions uh, that have been detected by this method with the 25 in the image uh, shown in, uh, in bold there. Uh, you can change the number that you want to show. You can annotate the genes, for example, by um, grabbing information from Drug Bank, which will make these individual genes a different color if the genes are have a relationship from Drug Bank. And uh, Rylonacept uh, apparently is a, uh, a drug that interacts with uh, uh, interleukin-1 here, IL-1A. Uh, you can navigate back to the genome browser itself uh, two ways now that you've moved off uh, off-site. If you use the genome browser link here at the top, you go back to the gene you were at when you first uh, got here, 
and I didn't actually intend to click that. Uh, you can also go here, which will sh uh, should take us to the TNF gene, uh, which is the one that's now centered in the uh, the genome graphic uh, and highlighted in yellow. Okay, so there's one other feature that I wanted to show you that's going to take more than the five minutes I have to show you, but I want to I'll do it. Uh, I do want to show you how to get DNA, and I'll get as far into that representation uh, as I can uh, by first by loading a session, and the session takes us to the CYP gene, and what I want to do is I want to grab some DNA from there, and I had intended to grab a couple of primers from there. I can perhaps finish this up tomorrow, so let's restore settings from uh, username example HG19 underscore CYP. So this will take us to uh, a region uh, in the CYP2D6 gene. I'll leave it up there for a second so you can see it if you're following along. Then I'll click the browser uh, link right there. And what we have here is a spot where we have isoforms of this gene um, with some differential splicing in the middle. The uh, one uh, isoform has three exons in the screen and the other one has uh, two. And then there's one here that's not translated. Uh, I didn't mention it earlier, but the untranslated regions on the ends of genes are shown in what we call half height boxes. They're not as tall as the other um, uh, boxes that are protein coding. And you can see here that these stripes, the dark and light stripes don't show up in this one that's not being translated in this region. So where I int intended to go up with this was to grab primers from both ends of the gene here and show you the two modes of um, ISPCR, uh, one which would give us the DNA in this region and one that would give us the products that would be there if we had um, done an amplification, a PCR amplification, using RNA as a template. In that case, these two different isoforms give us different size products, and ISPCR will give us those products. But for now, let's just go to view DNA, and I'll show you that you can just get the DNA in a FASTA file there, and it's just a bunch of Gs, As, and Ts, and Cs. I'll click back here, though, and show you the extended case and color options. If I click that, we can get the DNA, and we can get the DNA um, annotated. So I'll click lowercase to make everything lowercase except for the UCSC genes track, so that becomes capital in the exons, and I'll pick 255 for the maximum blue color here, and then hit submit. Uh, what we get from this DNA then is uh, lowercase things that are not exons, in this case it was all intron, and then the three exons in uh, uh, capital case uh, and in blue. So if I grab a chunk from here, and copy that, and I'm going to park it over here in a text file so that I don't lose it because I want to grab another piece here and then navigate away from this page. Uh, and it's easier to do that if I don't have to come back here and get the DNA again. So I'll grab a chunk of DNA there, copy that, and then navigate directly to our in silico PCR tool. At the in silico PCR tool, I'll paste that one as a reverse primer, flip its orientation, go back to the forward primer box. Oh, let me save that here too for future use. And then grab that one and uh, paste it. So I know I'm going a little bit fast, but the, uh, the video will be available and you'll be able to do it. And in fact, this is very similar to an example that we have uh, preserved in one of our videos on our YouTube channel. So you can find that. So we have two results here, and if I click into this upper result, I find that I'm at a, a location in the genome that is not even the location we started at. It's not CYP2D6, it's CYP2D7P1. And if you're looking at a screen as closely as I am at the moment, you can see that there's a little tick mark here in red indicating that this primer has a mismatch relative to this uh, the reference here. So that tells us that there's another location in the genome where we would have amplified um, DNA. Oops. Sorry, that means I'm out of time. But what I can do is I can click out by a factor of 10. Factor of 10 again, you can see how the display looks there. And you can see we got two hits, the original CYP2D6 and 
this neighboring gene, CYP2D7P1, uh, which represents uh, a reason why you might be interested in using this tool. Uh, you'll not only find the size of the fragments, uh, and you can get back to the details page here if I click, uh, you, you'll get to the size of the fragments themselves. <clears throat> um, it's 1115, but you'll determine whether or not the primers you're intending to use are unique in the genome. If they're not unique, it's best to know that before you waste any effort on the experiment. Um, on certain gels, the two, these two pieces, one is 15, uh, I mean 11, 15, uh, the other one is only slightly bigger. Uh, you might not be able to tell them apart. So thanks for your attention. Um, we're now going to turn to the uh, question portion. Uh, we've got about, uh, I think we have 15 minutes left at the end. Uh, yes. Yes, 15 minutes here. And uh, your moderator, Jeff, has been sending questions to my sidekick, Lou, over here. And uh, we're going to take the questions now and uh, see yes, what we can uh, do. I apologize if I was talking fast, because I know if you're stopping to ask a question, you may uh, lose the next thing I was uh, I said. But that's the nature of this uh, format. And when we're in, uh, in person, I much prefer to have you raise your hand, we can answer the question right there in, in person. Or all you got to do is look puzzled and I'll stop and ask you. So I'll switch back to the browser here and we'll see what uh, we have to say. Is Lou going to read them to me or is no, uh, Jeff going to read I'll read them to you, uh, Bob. So thanks, Bob. And yes, I have sent a few uh, questions that people raised during the presentation that were just like, you know, how do we get back to something? So Lou's answered those. Um, we oh, have a, a question. He was working in real time there. We Go have ahead, a please. question, and I, and I guess I wanted to sort of uh, extrapolate it out a bit. So someone was asking about how do we um, save the highlighted regions as a PDF again? And I guess I was I wanted to frame that question along the lines of that your documentation and how one might find that out by using your online documentation when we're not okay, in the web. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, well, the highlighted region if you have a region on the screen that's highlighted, it's highlighted on the PDF as well. And how do you so, set the um, screen with that as a PDF? Uh, okay, I did show that. You go view PDF right here. And then on the next page, there's an option to, uh, okay, I don't have a highlight here, but take my word for it. Um, the highlight would be saved. If you save the current graphic, it draws the graphic just the way you had it. See, I've got my two little PCR pieces here as well. Um, our documentation is pretty dense and it's very text heavy, uh, but let's go up under help and let's go up under browser documentation. And uh, some of this is sort of question and answer uh, FAQs, but if we go to the browser help si uh, page, I'm going to put down the headphones here and type in highlight and see what we come up with. We rely on Google uh, uh, search. You can see here that it's uh, searching our site uh, for Google Highlights. User's guide, for example, to highlight ESTs expressed. Display items in a different color. Let's just see what happens when we click that. It's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes it comes right up. And uh, what happened? Do we have highlight on this page? Let's see what happened. Maybe I, I'm a fairly poor typist. The time I'm not holding earphones to my head. <laughs> so let's try that. Information. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Let's send it to Google. Oh, maybe I, maybe I'm on the same page. Okay, maybe the word highlight was further down that page. Um, it's definitely not in multi-region view. We'll show you that tomorrow. That's a pretty cool uh, feature. Yeah. But that you, you can itself. search your documentation that way. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's where you find the documentation. Maybe it's just on this page. If I type highlight in the display, there's one version of it. It's hard to screen this. OK, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Zooming Thanks. in and scrolling that display. Um, um, Great. We have another couple of questions that are somewhat related. So one of them is, is it possible to analyze sequences that are not stored in the UCSC browser? And somewhat related to that is, um, well, actually quite a few people have, have been asking about uploading their own, but also um, sometimes uh, 
loading whole genome BAM files, 180 to 200 gig in size. Has someone's tried that, but it takes ages for uploading. So I guess the question is, how does you know, are there limits about uploading your own data and what types of your own uh, data? Yeah, there are. Typically about 100 uh, megabytes will uh, be the limit. And I did describe in passing earlier that the BAM file has to be loaded via a URL uh, on the uh, uh, on our server. So if you put your BAM file in a uh, server location where it's accessible via HTTP, then you load it into the browser via the HTTP link. So um, uh, there it is in red on my slide here. So you just put in, in our custom track page, and I can show you custom tracks tomorrow. You put in this one line, name equals whatever you want to call it, type equals BAM is required, and then big data URL as a pointer to your file. And in that way, the file itself is not being uploaded, but only the data that are needed to fill the screen wherever it is you happen to be at the moment. And then you can zoom around. Now I have a session that loads this exact one here that's on this track. And I can show you how that looks if you like. It'll take us just a second to do, to go to my data, my sessions. And this particular session is on HG18. Um, so if you type in HG18 um, underscore BAM snips, there I have it. I've just, I've used it recently. I just tested it to be sure it works here. HG18 BAM snips, it is case sensitive. So you want to have the capital S. If I load that, then I get the link up here. And now we're on HG18 with a BAM file uh, displayed, but we're only displaying 99 bases of it. If I want to zoom out and show 990 bases of it, you do that, it's grabbing new data out of that file off the web, uh, and it's not being uploaded to UCSC except as needed. And we cache the data so we don't even grab this chunk. If I zoom out again, this, that's by a factor of three, this middle third is already in the cache. It'll just grab the neighboring pieces to the right and left and load them. So if you're zooming around on it. Um, and if you save this as a session, the way we did before, this uh, My Data, My Sessions, it will save the pointer to this file and keep track of all of that until whoever owns the file removes it or moves it or something like that. And then, of course, the track is missing. Down below the browser graphic, we have a new... Uh, uh, blue bar group here called custom tracks and all of your data are in this blue bar group. Um, we also have data that are saved by other people and you're welcome to make your own track hubs uh, yourself. So under my data track hubs, there's a whole bunch of data that UCSC does not uh, own or load or uh, maintain. As you can see here, UCSC is not responsible for the content, but there are tons of data for a lot of different genome organisms here. And so if you loaded one of these hubs, you would have data from some third place, you would have our data, and you would have your own custom track data all loaded together into the genome uh, browser. And they're all uh, uh, zoomable in and out. You can use the table browser on them. Uh, we didn't talk about the table browser at all yet. Uh, we could extract pieces of data from them that way. Great. I think you said one Thanks. other thing too that I didn't address at the very beginning. That must be part uh, question there. It, I think it was just about uploading your own data that wasn't in the browser. So I think that's right. Uh, we didn't even get to that second uh, page, the URL I gave you. Um, if you open that page to um, bit.ly slash, uh, I think I said Australia 2018. Um, Oh. It's bit.ly UCSC AU 2018. Yes, I've sent that to everyone, all the attendees. Oh, really? Okay. So UCSC AU 2018? Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, I didn't load the custom tracks data on here. I'm going to load it probably in about an hour's time, there will be a file there. If you want to do it on your own and play with that, um, you need to be on HG19 to load it. So I'll switch back to there. Although you could also switch there from um, the custom tracks also. So my data, custom tracks, you can paste the URL or the data from that page. It'll be obvious because it'll be called ctexamples.txt. And those will be data that you own. 
And in fact, tomorrow I will also be showing you, I hope I'll have the time to do it, the, those two new data types that I showed you on my slides, the bar chart and the interaction type, these two right here. Okay, great. And so um, it's a fairly simple format. And so by, by loading those uh, uh, tracks, you can really kind of clued your way right into it, hack your way into uh, understanding how to do custom tracks. Um, the formats we support are shown up here. You can click into any one of them and read the details. Some of them like VCF and BAM uh, must be on a server somewhere, or you download our, uh, our laptop version of it. And then it's the, the software is next to the file. You don't have to be on a server in that case. Um, but either way, any one of these custom tracks then can be loaded. Okay, brilliant. Um, so unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, there are actually quite a few questions in the question pod. Um, we will have a copy of those. And what I'm proposing is that we will send those individually to uh, Bob and Lou to get those questions answered. Um, so yeah. what we'll do now is end, uh, we'll change presenters, Bob. So I will uh, take control. Um, just wrap up, do a bit of wrap up. Um, and so, Um, well, I'm having trouble to share this screen, but I will. I will just um, talk through the next uh, couple of minutes. So, um, so tomorrow we have a second webinar in this series. So, um, if you go to the Emble ABR webinars page, so that's emble-abr.org.au/webinars, you'll find out um, there's a web uh, there's a registration link for that. I think a lot of you are already registered. Um, and that will be about advanced features of the UCSC genome browser. Um, we also have an accompanying hands-on workshop um, that is that is uh, part of the uh, program with this particular um, uh, webinar. And this is a, a, a three-hour session that will be held at numerous uh, sites around the country. So um, James Cook University uh, at Cairns and Townsville uh, Melbourne Bioinformatics at the University of Melbourne, QCIF at the University of Queensland, the University of Adelaide, and the Sydney Informatics Hub at the University of Sydney. So that will be happening on the 8th of November. Um, and if you visit the uh, uh, mm -hmm. the um, the uh, the um, the uh, Emble ABR website um, and go to slash about slash events. Um, you'll be able to see that. Okay. And uh, finally, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge some uh, uh, some uh, people who have made this possible through funding. So firstly, uh, Emble ABR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne. Um, AIDC would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. Um, and Emble ABR would really also like to thank Dominic Gorse from, the Q, uh, from QFAB at our QCIP node. Um, he's initiated this series of UCSC genome browser training events, and he's also enabled its delivery through securing funding through a AGTA small grant scheme. So as this webinar closes, there'll just be a short survey. It's only going to take a minute or so uh, to complete it, so please fill that in. Um, thanks again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow, um, and we'll also get those questions answered for you. Thanks very much for attending.